Paul, three times, he uses the word ambition. Ambition's not a bad thing. Three times he talks right. about what godly ambition is. And of course, godly ambition is to fulfill the purpose of God in our generation, in our right. sphere of right. influence. That's godly ambition. Yeah. And so I think sometimes when I think about success, it's asking myself that question. Am I, am I really being fruitful with what has been given to me with the sphere of influence? right, that I've been trusted with. Okay, in case you didn't realize, I'm Greek. So I am very drawn to anything that happens in Greece, the whole deal. And I love the fact that today we're going to be talking about godly ambition. And I love the fact that at Better Together and in the 21st century, we're living in a time where we don't have to spend the whole program trying to tell girls, it's okay, you can have ambition, you know, you can desire something more for your life. I think we've been telling women that for um, a really long time, that we're actually starting to believe it and that the higher conversation mm -hmm. is going to need to be had, okay, right. what's godly ambition and what's selfish ambition, whether it's for men or for women, because mm -hmm. the right. fact is that, uh, right. you know, all of us, no matter what our gender is, is we ought to be pursuing godly ambition. And so let's just start at the beginning where you go, okay, are there chicks in the Bible that actually did? Well, of course, the first European convert was a woman yeah. and <laughs> it happened. She was baptised in Philippi. You're saying, why are you excited, Christian? because our A21 headquarters is in Thessaloniki, Greece, 45 minutes drive mm. up the road is Philippi. And this is where Lydia was water baptised. And you could tell mm -hmm. I'm Pentecostal or my Baptist friends watching this, you go, what other kind of baptism is there? But anyway, so us Pentecostals <laughs> like to confirm water baptised. And so it was like the first conversion, the first water baptism that happened. And it was a chick and not just any kind of chick. Okay, let me just say, this is going to blow your mind. The Bible says right. in the book of Acts chapter 16, Luke writes, so setting sail from Troas, we made direct voyage to Somathres and the following day, to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So again, I want to show you, um, it's not only Jesus in the Gospels that spoke to women. Here we are now, we're in Philippi, they're sitting down talking to the chicks and it says, um, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatira, a seller of purple goods. I mean, we've got a businesswoman for shout out to yeah. all the business chicks out mm -hmm. here. So she was a seller right. of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. <gasps> Christine, you mean you could be in business and worship God? Oh yeah, this is going to blow your mind right now, right here. So it says, and she was also a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So girls, just another shout out. Don't throw away everything Paul said because even the Lord opened up her heart to hear right. everything that was said by Paul. And after she was baptised and her household as well. This is what I love about chicks because once we get saved, everyone's getting saved with us. That's just the way that it is, whether you want <laughs> yeah, or not. Right. She right. urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Okay. So here is a woman. Obviously, she's a woman that knows what she's about. She's got a business. Um, she's selling her goods, yeah. purple goods, so fine linen. Uh, you could go to Proverbs 31 as well and see in the Old Testament, there's a precedent for this mm -hmm. kind of chick. Um, a yeah. woman that is fantastic, that is obviously got it together. She's a businesswoman and she runs a family mm -hmm. and she manages a household and she's got a whole lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And so some of you are wondering, you know, is God okay with that kind of woman? And, and I'm saying, yes. I'm, I'm now 55 this year. Can I say when I started in ministry in my early 20s, um, it, my particular sector of the church was very open to women maximizing their gifts. But as I started to travel, I realized that this is not everyone's story. A lot of people like, right. oh my gosh, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus must want to quench your gifts. He must want to quench your talents and he wants to minimize you. And, um, you know, I come from a Greek Orthodox home. So in my Greek culture, a woman was only, only encouraged to wash, iron, cook, clean, become a good wife, look after a husband. That was a cultural thing. That's not a Jesus thing. That was a, a cultural thing. And I had adapted a lot of that. So I had to renew my mind. Uh, when I got saved, 
And I felt the call of God and I didn't know what that meant. You go, what's the call of God? I felt called to Jesus Mm -hmm. to do whatever Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted me to do. That's what I still feel at 55. Mm -hmm. I'm called to Jesus to keep saying yes to Jesus. I didn't know I would be doing A21 at 21 when I was saved at 21 years old because I did not even know human trafficking existed. Some of you who are posting Mm -hmm. at 22 years old, the thing God's called you to do and what it is and how it's, I'm like, how do you even know what it's going to (laughs) be? I didn't even know trafficking existed when I was 21. I didn't even know that I would be yeah. doing what I'm doing with women. But I, my godly ambition was, oh, I want the gospel to go to the uttermost parts of the That's earth. Right. I don't care what part yeah. I play. I mean, anyone that knew That's me right. back then, they would tell you this to be true. I will do whatever I have to do to play a right. part in God's grand story of making mm. the name of Jesus Christ famous Amen. on the earth, of going into Amen. all the world and making right. disciples. Amen. I just took very seriously right. uh, the fact that I believed we were called for the evangelization of planet Earth before Amen. the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what I think yeah. everyone's job is if you're yeah, a Christian. Right. Yeah. But you could be a Christian yeah. businesswoman, that's your job. A Christian, a female, and right. you're a teacher. You're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a stay-at-home mother homeschooling 10 kids. Yeah. All the other stuff, when I say secondary, it's important because it's how God made you, but it's for the higher purpose right of going into all the world and making disciples of all nations. And so that is godly ambition. But you know, um, the word ambition I know is in scripture, uh, it's seven times and mostly it's in the context of do nothing out of selfish ambition, Uh, Paul writes. um, You know, Jesus did not consider, uh, he didn't do anything out of selfish ambition. He made himself, he lowered himself and made himself humble to fulfill um, the Father's purpose. But Paul, three times, he uses the word ambition um, in, he says, I have made it my ambition. And that was to take, make, take the gospel out further. I've made it my ambition not to preach in another man's field, but to preach in my, I have made it my ambition. To, so ambition's not a bad thing. Three times he talks right. about what godly ambition is. And of course, godly ambition is to fulfill the purpose of God in our generation, in our right. sphere of right. influence. That's godly ambition. Yes. Now we don't live in a world that's full of godly ambition. We are living in a world that is gonna press every button for every one of us, me and you, mm-hmm included to pursue selfish ambition. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything in right. our world is mm-hmm. self. We need you to be self-actualized. We need you to be self-realized. We need you to be self-determined. We, we need you mm-hmm. to live your best life. You do you, boo. It's all yeah. about becoming the best version of you, whatever the heck. The best version of me needed to be killed and I needed to be saved Amen. and delivered and healed. That's all I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to say. I needed, right. I needed to be right. dead to self yeah. and alive right. to Christ yes. in that sense. Um, yes. So Amen. I think in a culture that celebrates selfish ambition, We've got to be really be careful as Christian women. Lydia, uh, and the whole point coming full circle back to Lydia, is she was a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. She heard the gospel, got saved, got baptised, and the first thing she did was begin to give of her resources to say, okay, come to my house. Let's work this thing out. What am I going to do? What's my part in advancing the cause of the gospel Mm -hmm. Uh, through the gifts that God's given me, through the talents God's given me, through the resources God's given me, whatever sphere of life that is, Lydia had godly ambition. So she, she, it didn't diminish what she was right. doing before. It gave that greater purpose. Mm-hmm. And in fact, she probably right. uh, excelled even more because now there was a greater purpose right, for her right. resource and a greater that's purpose right. for a gift and a talent. And right. that's what I want to encourage women to do. Never from me am I ever going to try to put guilt, shame or condemnation, say, you know, oh, you've, you've got to just like minimise yourself, shrink yourself. I actually want you to fully flourish in life. We all do it better together, but to know what that is for, and it's for the purpose of the cause of right. the King and His kingdom. Right. Living in LA for like a thousand years or 38, something like that. Anyway, a long time. I think sometimes people um, become infatuated with the concept of fame, right? So they move to LA looking for um, fame and some some form of the entertainment industry, perhaps. And so I think sometimes we confuse success and fame. Mm-hmm. And I think right. that for for God, you know, to me, when I think about the definition of true success, that that I think I think true success is fruitfulness. Like one aspect of success mm-hmm. is fruitfulness. So if you think about, like in um, Matthew 25, right, the parable of the talents. 
you know, one was entrusted with five, one was entrusted with two, one was entrusted with one, right? And the, the, the one that had five doubled it, the one that had two doubled it, yay, Jesus was like, yay, well done, right? You took what was given to you and you were fruitful with it. And then there was one guy who just had one and he, all he did was hold on to the one, like he hit it, basically just had one. And like, not good things were said about that guy, right? It was not gonna go well for him. Right. And so, so for me, when I think about what success is, it's, it's fruitfulness. And the problem is we, we compare my level of fruitfulness with yours, right? So if the guy with the five and the guy with the two had compared themselves to one another, that would have been real trouble. But the truth is they were both successful because they had both been fruitful with what was entrusted to them. And so I think sometimes when I think about success, it's asking myself that question. Am I... Am I really being fruitful with what has been given to me with the sphere of influence, right, that I've been trusted with, whatever that would be? And I think our everyone's sphere of influence is different. You know, Christine's is different than Dee Dee's, it's different than Christie's, different than Lori's. So like on right here on this show, each of us, our sphere of influence is different, but are we being fruitful with what's been given us? And so I just think that that's the question when I think about what true success is, mm -hmm. it's not comparing myself to what someone else has, the, the level that they might have, but it's with what I've been given, whether it's a family, a church, yeah. a small group. Like, what, is, what have I been trusted with? What's been put in my hands? And am I actually growing it? Am I being fruitful with that? I love what you said, Holly, too, because I think one of the things that's so hard is this idea of success feels like a moving target. You know, it's like, what is success according to the world? It's like, you never can quite get there. I think um, it's Jamie Ivey that has a great quote, don't pursue success, pursue faithfulness. And it's just mm -hmm. like what you're talking about, faithfulness oh, yes. and, and fruitfulness in the example of the parable of the talents. But faithfulness, that's something I feel like I can wrap my head around. I can pursue, whereas success feels like I can't wrap my head around it and it's really hard to pursue. And so I love that reminder like you said in the parable of the talents, because it feels like that's so much more tangible and in line with scripture. Mm -hmm. I like that. Right. I mean, because when you think about success, for me, I like how you said it, Holly, because it's relative. Mm -hmm. You know, your level of success may not be what I consider success, and my level of success may not be what you consider success. So I think it's relative. I think if we would really understand what the scripture's, de the scripture's definition of what success is, then we will see that it's about whole life prosperity, meaning that I'm complete, mm -hmm. I'm full, and I'm satisfied in every area of my life. It's not just about having money in your pocket. And I think that has been the misnomer about what success is. We think it's just about money, and it's not, because I can have a whole lot of money and not be successful. I mean, like, I can have money in my pocket if my marriage is jacked up, my children are strung out on drugs and, you know, ministry is not going, going well. That's not success to me. And so I, I love that. I think it's all relative. I love, um, you know, our, our verse for, I think, this whole series this week um, in Joshua 1, 8, where the Lord says, you know, that if you study uh, my word, if you stay in my word day and night, then you will make your way prosperous Absolutely. and you will have great success. And I think we in the Christian world, have had a little bit of a problem with success. Now, some of us are afraid uh, to talk about it because we think, you know, you're not supposed to be successful. And what we have is a worldly concept of that. And yet the Bible says that you can have good success. Now, the implication is if you can have good success, there's got to be bad success as well. And I think sometimes some of right. <laughs> what we see um, on social media or in the world is this aspiration of a success that is external, how much you amass, how much you acquire, how much you accumulate. Mm -hmm. But biblical success, and I want us to use this word. I'm so glad that as women of God, mm -hmm. that we got the courage to take this on this week, because Absolutely. I think there's almost sometimes in the Christian church, this sort of anti-success thing. Somehow you're more holy mm -hmm. if you don't talk about success or you don't want to be, and I know we've got Christy right on here. <laughs> We've got like Dr. DG. I mean, like, listen, <laughs> uh, we're going to freak some people out here with some of the things that we're going to talk about um, because I want, like, I've got my daughter, my, my eldest is about to go to college. Do I want my daughter to be successful? 
Yes. Do I want my daughter to prosper? Yes. Do I want my life and my marriage to prosper? But I think because we have seen some excesses of these things in some aspects of the church, we think it's somehow holy not to talk about success or blessing or prosperity. And then what we're doing is not helping the people of God understand that the Bible says in Joshua 1, 8, that if you do what the word says, if you are careful to obey the statutes of the Lord, then then, this is what the Lord said to Joshua. Then you will make you. your way prosperous. Then you will yeah, okay. have great success. And when I was a 22-year-old kid, so messed up, out of brokenness, I grew up in the poorest zip code in my state, the third poorest zip code in all of Australia. Um, I was so messed up with my mind. I was so messed up relationally and coming from a background of abuse and brokenness and marginalization. You know, when someone told me at 22 years old about this scripture, it changed my whole life. Mm. It was like, Christine, you don't have right. to be a victim of your past. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a victim of what you grew up in. So in your mm -hmm. socioeconomic background, in the way that you were taught, you, Chris, be based on the word of God, you have the capacity to make your way prosperous and to have great success. You know what you said to me one time, Christine, I remember a long time ago, you said, I want the Christians to have the money. I want the Christians to be behind the microphone in front of the TV because we can make that much more of a difference for the kingdom. If you've got believers totally. that are having this worldly view of success, also the impact, the influence. So I love how you kind of clarified that there's good success and bad success, because I think people think, it's either biblical success or worldly success. You can't have both. They're mutually exclusive. And sometimes they're not the same thing, but sometimes they are. And you'll see the fruit of that in very tangible yeah. ways in your life. So I'm so glad you clarified that. Mm -hmm. The whole of our life that the success, any success I would get is not just for me. Right. Period. And I just right. think that you know, most who are watching this are followers of Christ. And when you're a follower of Christ, you realize that anything that is entrusted to you, whether it's, you know, health or finances or a career uh, or, you know, a, a television show, whatever it mm -hmm. is, it's mm -hmm. never just for you. And so the prosperity right. that, you know, that Christine was referencing, Joshua 1, 8, the success and prosperity is not just so I get to build a bigger me, right. it's so I can include right. other people on the journey. And so that's why we're so passionate about seeing people get successful, whatever it is, whether it's an education. If you're going to go to school, be good at it. Do well there. Be successful. You know, get that degree so that you can become whatever it is, a doctor, an attorney, a you know, CPA, whatever it is, mm -hmm. so you can be successful. And I think there are people who make their success all about them. And that's, what, what, that's the difference between fame, right? Fame is all about me. Fame is shine the spotlight on me because it's all about me. Mm -hmm. But success, true biblical success, is always inclusive of other people. Always. It's always, always for mm -hmm. other people. It's like, what do I have that I can share with you? You're, I, I've, been, I've had success right. in writing books. Do you want to write one with me? Because maybe that'll help you. It's like sharing the success. Mm -hmm. I just think that's the real definition is it's not just about us. Otherwise, we'd just be, you know, selfish, fat Christians. <laughs> it's not the goal. I remember once listening to a preacher and, and he was saying that he says, money says to a missionary, I can send you. Money says to um, a person that hasn't got food, I can feed you. Money says to a traffic victim, I can help get you out of there and I can help um, to yeah. reach you, to rescue you, to restore you. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. Money itself is neutral. It's what you do with it. Money right. in the hands right. of a godly person mm -hmm. can be used for godly purposes. Money in the hands of a drug trafficker is really bad. Right. Money in the hands of a sex trafficker is really bad. But money in the hands of a, a Christian that thinks, man, we can help to alleviate global poverty. We can help to bring justice on the earth. We can help with a, you know, a housing crisis. We can help send um, food and water and plumbing supplies to our brethren in Texas. Well, the fact is that if we in the church 
are so scared to talk about this because there have been excesses and there have been abuses and there have been misuses, Mm -hmm. then we're never going to talk about anything because in every sphere of life that people have taken certain doctrines and been excessive with those Mm -hmm. doctrines or misused those doctrines Mm or used it to put people down. And um, and I, I know, and again, we're being so honest at Better Together. So yes, I understand some people are a bit nervous because they're right. like going, well, the kind of Christianity that says, you know, um, if you are not healed, there's something wrong with your faith. Or if you are not wealthy, there's something right. wrong with your faith. And that is the reaction to what people say, uh, the prosperity doctrine, that somehow you're saying that you're less than if, and you're saying God is going to do this. But But what we're saying with this is that prosperity, blessing and success is a whole of life thing. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that the word of God, it's not me. It's God's word says, if you abide in this word and if you do this, then you will make your way. Now, that doesn't mean, and we're saying this from episode one, no one is saying that means you're going to be in Hollywood. Holly set it up. It doesn't mean you're going to get an Oscar (laughs) tomorrow. It doesn't mean you're going to live in a house in the Hollywood Hills. It doesn't mean you're going to have a blue check on your social media profile. (laughs) Nobody's talking about that. We're talking about having the grace and the provision, um, the blessing, the mercy, the love of God to be able, whatever situation you find yourself in, Mm -hmm. to be able to have success in that realm. And like, Mm -hmm. I love what you said, Mm -hmm. Laurie, what what you just went through in Dallas with the the freezing and the ice freezing. Well, you know what? Success was the fact that you... Uh, did not lose your mind when you had no water, (laughs) when you were freezing (laughs) and it was under zero degrees. Well, you know what you went? I pretty much mostly through the grace of God, he gave me the strength to be able to go through that. Um, A single mum putting kids through school and, and and renting. You know what? She will look back and go, the grace of God, he gave me success through that season to get my kids through, to go. Like, so, so that is what we're talking about is that you could still have faith and life and be producing um, and be fruitful no matter what your external circumstances are. That's the kind of success right. we're talking about. Well, I think one of the things that's hard about success, like I said in the beginning, is it feels like a moving target, even as a believer. It's like, okay, what does this look like? And, you know, we have an opportunity in a really practical way in every season of life to go, okay, God, what does success look like in this season or this week? In your example, Lori, what does success look like this week? Some weeks for me or some days, success looks like walking on a stage and being faithful to the gifts God has given me and stewarding those gifts on that stage with that group of people. Some days, it means changing a diaper and having a good attitude and being nice to my husband. And that is success that day. And it doesn't always look like big and flashy and impressive. Mm -hmm. But I think that when we look at success as encompassing more than just fame in Hollywood, like you said, Holly, that it is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. It is fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. It is stewarding your gifts, the um, qualities that God expects of us, these, these values to live that out in faithfulness, then that is success in that season or that day, depending on what God's asking of us. And I love this reminder from Joshua when it tells us how to do that. Mm -hmm. If we're going, I don't know how to be successful according to the Bible's God. Oh, well, meditate on my word day and night. When you know who God is Mm -hmm. and you know what he says, Mm -hmm. you will know what to do. You will be connected to the spirit and he will guide you as you take steps of faith. And so I just, it sets us free to take action and not feel like we're paralyzed by fear and also not feel like, that those steps of action are all about us. It's steps of faith for what God's doing and what he's asking of us in that season, that faithfulness, that fruitfulness, that type of success. Mm -hmm. I think when we, um, the more we follow God, the more, more we do what he says, right? Then we will experience success. You know, the, the greatest test of someone's character is to give them just a little bit of fame. And so then you see it, what's going to happen. And if in the quiet places, of my heart, if after I have experienced any sort of recognition, if in the quiet places of my heart, I don't actually deflect it to him and say, thank you. Right. I'm grateful for what you've trusted me with. How can I use it to build your kingdom? If I don't do that, then I'm in trouble. Right. And so I think the people, yeah. I know that Didi does that. So, you know, Didi's been entrusted with 
you know, great success in so many areas. And so I, but I know her. And so I know that in her heart, she's not going, yeah, it's all about me too. And I'm just going to build bigger and put a bigger star on the top of my house. And no, that's not what she's doing, mm-hmm. right? It's about, it's about how can I use what you've trusted me to build your kingdom? Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's what, that's the sign of someone who's walking in true success is that mm-hmm. there is this element of humility mm-hmm. when you realize it's not yours anyway. 